I got to thank the worship team this morning for blessing us like they do every Sunday. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wow, we are so blessed. So last week, we did get to wrap up 1 John, and i um, going to take a little bit of a step away this morning. Um, we don't get to do very many topical messages since we study verse by verse here, usually. But we're going to do that this morning. I want to do a little bit of a topical. We've called this one The Journey. I believe that's what we called it. So open your Bible, please, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, the journey. How many of you know it is a journey, huh? And how many of you know that it's a journey that can take you so many different places, right? How many of us know that it, how easy it is has been, perhaps, to journey along the wrong path. Maybe kind of get out of kilter with things. Our lives, they get out of balance. And generally, you know, when we find ourselves on that particular journey, it's a very self-centered journey. It's a very self-consuming journey journey, and it's always a journey that ends in dire thirst. It's always a journey that never brings us to the place that we would like to be, that place of fulfillment, lasting fulfillment, not temporary fulfillment, not a few hours of fulfillment, I'll use that word, but a journey that has a dead end to it. And many of us know that. And you know, this morning, I don't think that it really matters if you, maybe you had a drug issue or an alcohol issue or an anger issue or whatever your issue, all that outward stuff that everybody's able to see and go, oh boy, that guy's, he needs prayer, you know, poor fella. But then there's that part also inside of us, too, that struggle that goes on inwardly with us, that we're so good at masking. We're so good at putting on that little costume that we wear with that smile and everything is okay when inside we're just falling apart. That journey sometimes for folks that pursue great education and great career, um, Great riches, if you will, accolades, fame, all of those things. And those of us that perhaps went down that road, it's amazing to me that all of these different scenarios, they all wind up at the same place. They all wind up at that dead end, don't they? They all get to that place where they discover it doesn't matter if it's money or good looks or health or fame or temporary escape from reality or whatever. It all ends up futile. I think there's another journey that I want to look at this morning, and I would imagine that most of you in here are familiar with these passages that we're going to read today commonly known as the Beatitudes. And they've been taught in many different ways, many perspectives, many angles. When I was a kid growing up, as I would have people talk about these Sundays in Sunday school or in church or whatever it might be, I always thought these were things that I needed to do. Things that I needed to strive for. And then as I got older and I began to see the patterns in my life and the journey that I was on, which was on one of those dead-end roads, if you will, and getting to that place, getting to that dead end where it would appear that 
there's really nothing left. Where do you turn? Where do you go? Fortunately, I found Jesus. Fortunately, you found Jesus. But, you know, I do believe that there is, if you will, a process to this particular journey. And one of the first things we find out about the process of this journey is brokenness. We saw that in this last song that we sang together. I'm broken inside. We become broken inside because we come to understand the futility of our lives, the emptiness. You know, I remember the story of Jesus going through Samaria when he didn't need to go through Samaria, but he chose to. And he encountered the woman at the well. I'm sure you're familiar. And he had a little dialogue with that gal and discovered that she was there to get water from Jacob's well. And as Jesus is talking to her, this is in the middle of the afternoon, in the desert, 110 degrees maybe, hot, hot. Oh, it's a dry heat though. (laughs) Microwaves are dry heat too. Why was she out there in the heat of the day? Why didn't she go early in the morning when it was cool, when all the other women of the village would go to get water? It was because she was ostracized. It's because she wasn't socially acceptable. It was because she had been on a journey that cost her relationships in her community, with her family, with her religion, And the only time that she could really go there, because of her shame, was when no one else would. And Jesus met her there. And this is a woman who truly was broken. Sometimes when we're broken, we try to fight it. We try to combat it and say, oh, I'm all right, I'm going to make it through, I've been through worse. And deep down inside, we know how many more times can we do that? before we are totally broken. Some are very stubborn and they become broken over and over and over again and you wonder, will they ever learn? I just want to read down through here a little bit and pick up what Jesus is talking about in chapter 5. Let's read these Beatitudes together and then we'll unpack them. Verse 1 says, seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Interesting that in Jesus' time, First thing I noticed here, which was pretty cool, in Jesus' time, when he would teach, we see, what the, we see what the pattern was here. He would go up onto a mountainside or sit down on steps or find a place that was comfortable, and he would sit down, and all of the disciples would gather and stand up while he was teaching them. 
So just to be Jesus-like, I think we ought to change that. I think I'll get a chair, and you guys can all stand up every Sunday while we're doing this, right? No. But that's how they did it back then. And it says that he sat down, his disciples came, and he opened his mouth. Why does it have to say that in there? Wouldn't that be assumed that if he's going to teach, he has to open his mouth? But I think it's an important little tidbit. Because, you know, you and I are kind of in the same situation. If you don't open your mouth, how's anybody going to know what you believe? You might think, well, I live a good life. Yeah, but for what and for who? Why? It's okay to live a good life. I mean, it's wonderful. But it's not going to get you to heaven, is it? And if you think it is, you're on the frustration road yourself this morning. Because the Bible says that we've all sinned. It says that we've all come short of the glory of God. We've all come short of that standard that God has set for each and every one of us because of His holiness and His perfect perfection. So being on this journey, bumping into walls, tripping, falling, starving, dying of thirst, Jesus encounters this poor woman at the well and He gives her hope. And He tells her, you know, You're going to come here in the heat of the day, and you're going to draw water out of that well. And these weren't wells where you, like, crank up the bucket kind of well. These were like pits. And you'd have to go down into this thing, and you'd have to put your container in there and fill it up. And the water always wasn't, you know, the kind you get from the water purifier over here. It was a laborious thing to get water out of these wells. And Jesus encountered this woman. Now, could it be possible that Jesus chose to take a different route to his destination in order to have an encounter with this one human being? Is that possible? Is it possible that he knew her before he ever got there? He knew that she would be there. He knew that she would be in a place of despair and brokenness and shame. And he went out of his way to have this encounter with her. Could you imagine? Well, you can imagine that because Jesus did that for you. He did it for me. He went out of his way. He could have bypassed us. He could have went on. He could have taken the easier road the cooler path along the river, perhaps, where there's shade and fresh water to drink. But no, he goes through the desert to encounter you and me on purpose because he has a message. He said, my dear, you're going to draw water out of here and lug it back to your village and your family. And you know what? Tomorrow in the afternoon, you're going to have to do the same thing again. That water that you're pulling up out of that well of your life, whatever you're drinking from, you're going to thirst again, no matter what it is, whether it be riches, fame, drugs, whatever, sports, you're going to thirst again. It's never going to be enough. You're always got to come back to the well. And Jesus looked at the woman and he said, I've got some water that you can drink that will satisfy you forever. The water that I give you is living water. As a matter of fact, it won't just satisfy you. The Bible tells us that that living water will begin to spring up out of us and overflow out of us and splash on people around us. Isn't that cool? I think that's awesome. So what I want to do this morning is I want to share this journey through the Beatitudes. I'm convinced the longer I live that a person truly has to come to the end 
of themselves before they can begin to have a relationship with Jesus. As long as you have confidence in you and your abilities, you're going to struggle knowing Jesus. It's going to be hard because you're still trying to do what the natural man would do, not the man of the Spirit. And when we come to Christ, we become spiritual people, don't we? We're not just controlled by the lusts of our flesh any longer, nor even the imaginations of our minds, or perhaps lofty goals. We become controlled by the Spirit of God that lives in us. He directs our paths. He chastens us when we're wrong. He blesses us. He abides with us, and that brings us true fulfillment in our lives. You can be the poorest of poor and have the Holy Spirit living in you and have the peace that passes all understanding, the joy that doesn't go away. You can be the richest of the rich, but without that Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you'll never know that real joy. You'll never know that real peace. There's got to be a time when we come to the end of me. When I come to that place in my life where I'm crawling up to the cross and I'm begging the Lord, as Peter did, as he sunk into the waves and he said, Jesus, save me. I thought I could do this on my own. I was blown away. I'm actually standing on the water. Aren't I cool? And the next thing he knew, he was sinking. And he cried out to the Lord. I'm really glad that Jesus didn't say, how long can you tread water, Peter? I'm glad he didn't say, you know, I tried to tell you that you got to trust me and not you. You can't be afraid of the winds and the waves. No, he didn't do any of that. He just reached out and took his hand, just like he did to you and me. Without condition. Because when we came to him in that condition, when we came to him in that state of mind, we were broken. We were impoverished. We were born that way. Did you know you were born a sinner? (gasps) How could you say that? It's true. We were born poor in spirit. All of us, everybody, ever since the garden. We were all born with a propensity to sin. Whatever color you want to paint that. It came natural. You even see it in our children. Our little innocent children. That are greedy and violent. Disrespectful. Really, a cute little child? I have grandchildren. I've watched them feud over a tractor. You know, the big guy, he's got four tractors. The little guy's got one. The big guy says, I want his tractor. So he takes one of his tractors over and he hits him with it, grabs the other one, and takes off. Sweet, innocent little thing. That's a crime. If he was an adult, he'd be in prison. That's strong arm robbery, assault and battery, maybe attempted murder. Oh, but children don't have a sinful nature, do they? Absolutely. They just are young sinners and they just grow up to be better sinners. Worse, I should say. But you know, being born poor in spirit, could be looked upon as doomsday if it were not for Jesus. And so he tells us in this first one, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. That word blessed means happy, hilariously happy. Kind of a contrary 
thing in terms, isn't it, it seems like? Aren't you happy that you're impoverished spiritually? I don't think that's what the Lord is saying here. He's saying that we're blessed, even though we're poor in spirit, we're blessed because God has made a way. And as we continue to look down this list, we're going to find what that way is. But the first thing that has to happen is I have to come to that place in my life. You have to come to that place. People watching us today have to come to that place where they do admit, man, I am impoverished in my spirit. There's got to be something more to life than this. And one of the first things that we do when we discover that truth It really doesn't make our day that wonderful. We actually begin to have a a feeling of mourning over our condition. And that's what the second beatitude is. Blessed are those that mourn. You've discovered your poverty in spirit. You've discovered your need. And now it seems you're even worse off than you were before you discovered it. The word mourning in here, the word mourn, is exactly what it means. When you lose a loved one, when death comes, we mourn over that. And you're really mourning in this beatitude over the truth that you've discovered your own spiritual death. And you're mourning over it. But you're on the path. You're on that leg of that journey that will lead you to the promises that are attached to these beatitudes. Discovering that I'm poor in spirit is the first step to the kingdom of heaven. Mourning over my spiritual condition is another step towards comfort and fulfillment and peace. And suddenly, after I've realized these things, It doesn't seem like I'm so arrogant anymore. Maybe I'm not so proud anymore. Maybe I've come to realize that I'm just not all of that at all. I've come to realize that my real place in this world, in this life, is not where I thought it was. It wasn't necessarily on top to be in control of everything. And I come to realize that there's so much more things that I can't control than what I can control. The third one says, blessed are the meek. Now, we want to be careful here because meek does not mean weak. What do you think of when you think of meek? Do you think of some shriveled up little humble fella? out there that can't even lift an arm or take care of himself, he's, he's meek. No, that's not what meek is. Jesus was meek. I've come to realize really what I am. I am a sinner. I do tend to rebel against God's law naturally. And I've come to that place where now I'm broken and I'm mourning over my brokenness and I'm no longer thinking I'm on top of the world I've become meek. I've become open to hear good news at that time in my life. You know, the word meek is an interesting word. It actually means power under control. That's what that word means. It doesn't mean weak. If you take a horse, for instance, out in the wild, that horse will stomp you down if you get too close. He'll run you over. He'll bite you. But when that horse is broken, when that horse comes under the control of its master, James talks about putting a bit in a horse and how we can control this humongous animal with this little bit in its mouth. And so you've got this How much do they weigh? 1,800 pounds? No, 15,000 pounds? Big. 
But yet that animal, with all that strength and all that ability to stomp and bring harm and pain, can be brought to a place where you can put a little child on that animal, and it would be as safe as could be. Because that horse has been brought under the control. Even though he has the power, the power has been brought under the control of the master. Pretty picture of what meekness truly is. You have the power to say, I don't want anything to do with that Jesus thing. I'm going to live my own life. I can do it on my own. You have the power to do that. But when you come to verse 3 and verse 4, you discover really quickly, I need more than that. I need to take this power of rebellion that I have, and I need to set it to the side. I need to take my agenda and put it to the side, and I need to let God put his bit in my mouth and say, Lord, I'm submitting my life to you to control it and to teach me how to be meek, how to bring that power that you've given me under control. The meek will inherit the earth. That's kind of a mock oxymoron in a way because most people, you would ask that question, they say, no, only the strong will survive. Only the one with the biggest bomb will survive. But you see, it's an interesting thing how the world looks at something and how God looks at things that they can be totally opposite from one another. God says here, Those who have brought their lives under the control of the master to do his will and his bidding, they will inherit the earth. And when I get to that place, how refreshing is it to surrender? Huh? Do you remember when you did? When you had all those burden of guilt and shame in your life, and you came to the cross and you experienced forgiveness. You came broken, and you said, Lord, I want to let you control my, my, my world, my dreams, my hopes of what this life would be. I begin to experience something that I've never experienced before, and that is a desire to want to know more about God. I have that driving force in me that says, I want to know more. I have a hunger for God. I am thirsting for righteousness. I can't get my face out of the Bible. I can't stay away from my brothers and sisters. I've never been more happy than when I'm around the family of God studying his word together whether it be on a Sunday or a Wednesday or a women's group or whatever it might be, a men's group. We feed on the Word because we now have a new hunger. It's not a hunger and thirst to do it my way. You know the guy that used to sing that song? He was wrong. Oh, he might have done it his way, but that doesn't make it the right way. Jesus is saying to us today, do it my way. Follow me, he said. We have this hunger and thirst. And it promises us in verse 6 what will happen when we have, begin to have this hunger and this thirst for righteousness. It said, we will be filled. Suddenly, all those other wells out there in the desert that we were drinking from and having to go back to all the time, we don't have to go there anymore. We don't have to hang out in those dark places where the alcohol flows and the gambling is flowing. We don't have to do that anymore because we don't need that anymore because now we're being filled with righteousness. We don't stop doing those things because we don't want to go to hell. We stop doing those things because we don't need them anymore. We've been set free from those things. Those shackles that I've been wrestling with all my life, one day they just fell off. 
that chain just came undone. And I turned around and I looked, and there it was behind me. Oh, glorious day. I'm delivered. I don't have to drag that ball and chain around anymore. And that ball and chain was released by him, by Jesus, by his love for me, by his mercy. We've been filled. And in being filled, we begin to understand exactly what that word mercy is. We didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve to be filled with righteousness. We didn't even deserve for him to meet us in the wilderness, but he did. As a matter of fact, you and I, we deserve one thing. Hell. That's what we deserve. That's what we've earned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You are very well aware of what wages are. That's something that you earn. I work hard for a living and I get a good wage. I sin real hard in life and I'm going to get the wage that's coming to me for that behavior, death. But the gift of God is eternal life. You know, I gave a, <clears throat> a hat away to a fellow a few weeks ago. And uh, he came to me and he's thanking me for it and all. And he says, so what do I owe you for it? You don't owe me anything. It's a gift. Oh, come on. Someone had to pay for it. Why don't you let me just pay you what it, you know? No, then it wouldn't be a gift anymore, would it? It's no different in our relationship with Christ this morning. It's a gift, you guys. Don't try to pay him back. The moment you try to pay it back, it's no longer a gift because you're trying by your own efforts, your own works, <laughs> we'll put a better word on it, contribution, if you will, to pay it back. You can't. If you try that, then it no longer is a gift. The gift of God is eternal life. It's free to you and me. But there was a price that had to be paid. And Jesus paid that price for you and me so that we could be able to accept the free gift of salvation, to be delivered from that desert wilderness, from that well that would not satisfy. God's mercy, blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Something begins to happen in me. I begin to change those that I was holding grudges against. All of a sudden, I, I don't feel grudges anymore. It's really not that important. I would rather forgive them and just move on. You know, that's where a lot of us get stuck, isn't it? <clears throat> well, you don't know what he did to me for so many years, how he treated me. I'll never forgive him. I'll never forgive her. I'll never forgive them. Jesus said something, and this might be shocking to you. If you can't forgive people their sins against you, then God will not forgive your sins. Wow. And you might say, well, that's impossible. And I know some of us are in here this morning going, oh, my gosh. I have a lot of unforgiveness in me. And you know what I say to you today? Let God's love get in there. Let the Holy Spirit get in there. Let the fact that he pulled you up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he put your feet upon a rock. He did that for you. He forgave you. And none of us is no less guilty than anybody else. You know, it doesn't matter if you have a runny nose. It doesn't matter if you have a fever. It doesn't matter if your eyes are all bloodshot. Those are just symptoms of a disease, or a cold, or the flu. They're just symptoms. We've all got the same disease. It was called sin. Many of us showed it in different ways in our lives, but it was all the same disease, the same problem, the same terminal illness. And God provided a cure for you and me that yes, when God's love begins to move into your life, 
And you begin to realize, you know, I'm really just like everybody else. We're all in the boat together. We're all experiencing that blood of cleansing us from sin, that love of God that's inside of us now. That w- I saw a guy do something one day, and I'll share this with you. It's pretty cool. I don't do a whole lot of visual aids or anything for you. I've done it a couple times. But this one I saw happen, and I wish I'd have thought ahead. I might have done it today. But I saw a fella come in with a, a glass, clear glass. In the bottom of it, there was mud. And he had a pitcher of water. <clears throat> and he began to pour the water from the pitcher into the glass. And as the glass filled up, of course, it was pretty mucky looking. But as he continued to pour that water in there, that water got clearer and clearer and clearer until all of that dirt had been washed out of that glass. It had gone out of that glass. It had fallen off to the side, and that glass was just as crystal clear as the water that was in the pitcher. You see, those things that are muddy in your life, and you're obsessed with trying to clean your glass, it won't work. We need to be pouring in the living water into that glass, and the more you pour it in, the purer it's going to become. That glass is your heart. It's your mind. It's the things that were done wrong to you, or perhaps the things that you did wrong to someone else. But as I continually allow that to flood my life, It begins to wash away those things. It's not on an effort on my part to turn the glass over and shake it and rub it out and try to... You can't do that. It just doesn't work. I can't reach it. But boy, his living water can. Amen? It can reach down in there to where those unforgiving places are. It can make you know what mercy is. And I'll tell you what mercy is. It's not getting what you deserve. That's what it is. And again, I asked that question earlier, what do we deserve? Well, I'm not going to repeat it. But God is saying, you're not going to get what you deserve. You're going to get so much more. Your glass is going to be cleared. You're going to be clean. You're going to be washed in the water, in the spirit in that living water. And as we become clearer, cleaner, if you will, it becomes possible to say, hey, I can forgive that abuse. I can forgive that mistreatment because I know that I'm a sinner too and they're sinners and their symptoms might have been different than my symptoms, but yet we are all sinners just the same. And and if Jesus can forgive me, then who am I? to not forgive someone else. I mean, when you look at it like that, it seems almost doable, doesn't it? And it is doable, but we got to do it His way. We become merciful, and then we obtain mercy. And as this uh, process continues, we're walking down this new path. We're studying God's Word. We're being cleansed from the inside out. Our motives begin to change. Our hearts change. You know, God does heart surgery on us, doesn't he? When he comes into our lives, he does heart surgery on us. He changes. Change my heart, oh God. What a prayer. Make it ever true. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, really, being pure in heart, is a, there's, a, there's a picture for that, too. It's having a single perspective on things. If your eye is single, then you're focused on that one thing. But if you've got double vision, if you've got one eye in the world and one eye on Jesus, boy, it's not going to work. I can tell you that right now. It will not work. You'll be a frustrated person. And chances are, eventually, you may give up. And walk away and just go right back to the misery you came from. Happens all the time, doesn't it? 
To be pure in heart is to have one focus in mind, and that is to live for Him and do the things that please Him. Because I know that if I do the things that please Him, the natural response is going to be peace and goodness in my life. Don't you want that? Don't we all want that? I want peace of mind. How about you? I want to know I'm forgiven. How about you? We're humans. I think deep inside we all want the same thing. And above all, I want to be loved. I want to have that security blanket of love wrapped around me. And only Jesus provides that for us. He's the only one that can. And so I realize that and I become pure in heart. I say, I'm going to keep my eyes on the prize. I'm not going to look back because the Bible tells me the old things have passed away. They're gone. Now, can I learn from those things? I certainly can, but I'm not going to live there anymore. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I got a new perspective. My heart is no longer divided. I don't have double vision. I've made a commitment to walk with the Lord, no matter what. Kind of like when we take our marriage vows. How easy it is for folks to forget those, huh? Through thick and thin, richer or poorer, you know. Yes, I'll do that. I've done many weddings, and there's nothing more fun than to watch the groom stand here and the bride come down the aisle, and he's just going. (laughs) He's scared, and he's excited, and, you know, that's his. You're his. We're his bride. And to have that relationship with him, to be able to have one focus, and that would be on pleasing the Lord. Jesus said, I always do the things that please my Father, even when it's not convenient. I remember getting on a transit bus in San Diego years ago to go watch a Padres game. And it was good to get on the bus because you could go right to the stadium, you know, no parking and all that jazz. It was great. But there was a gal on there, and she was preaching at everybody. And she was so obnoxious, people were telling her to sit down and shut up. She was making people angry because she was pointing the finger and condemning and throwing lightning bolts at everybody, and she was representing God's love in a way that wasn't real. And the whole bus, Christian or not, were turned off by it. You see, sometimes people do that, don't they? They kind of misrepresent what we're about. We're not about getting people down on the ground and doing this to them. Jesus never did that. Basically, Jesus said, hey, come to me. Those of you who labor, those of you who are struggling to try to find a meaning in life, come to me. I'll give you rest. I'm not going to beat you down. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to tell you you're worthless. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you that you're so valuable in my eyes that I'm going to lay my life down for you. Every single one of you in here are a precious treasure in God's eyes. You may not feel that way sometimes, but that's how he feels. He sees us a lot different than we see ourselves, doesn't he? So we become pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you, but it's my peace that I give to you. It's a different peace than what the world offers. And when we have that dwelling in us, we too find ourselves being peacemakers. The calm voice in the midst of the turmoil. The soft answer that turns away wrath. Have you ever read that before? It's true. And I'll tell you, I'm guilty of violating that on many occasions. Because I get excited too. I want to get up in your face once in a while. And the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. The soft answer, the calmness, the peace. God's love, that's what will get through all this turmoil. You become a peacemaker because you made peace with your maker. Does that make sense? 
I've heard it said, prepare to meet your maker. You know, I'm not prepared. Yeah, we can be prepared right now. We make peace. Matter of fact, the Bible says that, that, that wall that was between you and God was tore down. It was knocked over by Jesus. There's nothing else there to hinder us anymore from making peace with God. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding rules in our hearts and in our minds. They'll be called sons of God and daughters of God. Don't want to leave you girls out. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Can't we just skip over that one? I mean, you've just been talking about all these great things of peace and pure in heart. Now you're talking about persecution? The Bible says everybody who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's, part, it's one of those promises in the Bible that maybe you would rather not read. We will suffer persecution. For what? For being obnoxious? For being judgmental? For being condemning? No, that's not what he says here. He says persecuted for righteousness' sake. For doing the right thing. <laughs> How many of you know you step outside these doors here and you go back out in that world right there and people will persecute you because you're who you are? They will tell you that you're ignorant. They will tell you that you just don't meet the plan, their plan. I'll tell you this morning, I'm just glad that we can meet God's plan. That's really the most important thing, I think, isn't it? Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. How do you respond? Lashing out, vengeance, anger. I don't think that's the right way to lash out, to do those things. Look at how Jesus responded. As a matter of fact, the ultimate persecution of all, when he looked down and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're lost, Lord. Forgive them. The ultimate persecution for righteousness' sake. And you know, because he responded that way, it says the kingdom of heaven was his. That's where he went. And that's where we're going to go one day to be there with him. He goes on in verse 11 and he says, blessed are you when they revile you and they persecute you and they say all manner of evil against you falsely. There's the big word, folks, falsely. That's why it's so important that we observe how we live our lives in front of them. That's why it's so important that you remember that you will, uh, verse 13, we probably won't get to it, but you're the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you're the light of the world. You're the representative of Jesus Christ on this planet, in your workplace, in your family, in your social groups. They're saying all kinds of evil against you falsely. For my sake, he said. Are we willing this morning to suffer false accusations for his sake? Sure, we should be, shouldn't we? We should be ready, willing to do so. But you notice that this particular passage is not at the top of the list. If this were the first beatitude, boy, we'd be in big trouble. But we've been through this process. We've been on this journey from the first one down to verse 11, and we've gone through all of these different things to develop in ourselves a place where we can suffer persecution. We've been through the process of the fire, God's purifying fire, cooking out the dross out of our lives. You know, without that, we would never make it. We wouldn't be able to suffer falsely for his sake. And then he says in verse 12, something very cool. If that's happening to you, rejoice. <laughs> of 
Aren't you thrilled that your family's putting you down and trying to make you look like an idiot and they've ostracized you and you haven't spoken to some of them for years because you're a Christian? Rejoice. How can I rejoice? Gee whiz, our passage in 1 Thessalonians this morning kind of said something about that, didn't it? I think it says, rejoice always. Rejoice. And not just rejoicing, but it says, be exceedingly glad that you and me are able to suffer for his name's sake. And we think we're suffering. We really don't know what suffering is, do we? We could have said someone calls us a fanatic or, I'm not coming to church because it's full of hypocrites. Oh, you're saying I'm a hypocrite. Yes. Oh, my God, I've been persecuted. What am I going to do? No, how about being thrown in a lion's den and watching your children get torn to pieces and all you got to do is say, Jesus was fake. But you don't. That's persecution. And you know what? It's still going on to a, to a certain degree in our world today. With some Christians, that's their existence. They're living on a life and death situation where at any moment they could lose their head for their faith, or their limbs, or their children, or their wives. That's persecution. And Jesus said, Rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. Paul must have read that when he was down in the prison, in the dungeon. The Bible says at midnight they were worshiping the Lord. They were praising the Lord. We read another passage in Acts that they were persecuted and they were thrown out of town. And it says that they were blessed because they were found worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Those who are persecuted for Christ, those who are martyred for Christ, they will receive a special reward, special crown. It's called the martyr's crown. Jesus said, great is your reward in heaven. And he finishes up by saying, and by the way, you're in really good company. Why don't you guys come on up and uh, we'll get ready to wrap this up and you can share your awesome songs with us as we close. It says your reward is great in heaven because they also persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's not a new thing. It's something that's been going on from the beginning. If you study the Old Testament, you'll get a real quick idea of some of the things that the prophets went through in order to deliver God's message to the people. And you know, you might not know this, but who was the very last Old Testament prophet? John the Baptist. That's right. You know, he was still under the Old Covenant. The blood of Jesus hadn't been shed. He hadn't risen from the dead, but yet John got his head cut off. The ultimate persecution, if you will. He says, you're in good company. I'm going to put you in the company of prophets. I'm going to put you in the company of faithful people. We've been studying Hebrews 11 for the last couple of weeks, the hall of faith. And to see what happened to some of these people and how they were able to maintain their commitment to the Lord unto death, it's amazing. And they were under the old covenant. How much more now that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us does God enable us to have victory over the minute little persecutions that we might go through? Now, I'm not saying it's not going to happen to us at some point or sometime. We don't know. But you know what? I want to stay in good spiritual shape just in case it does, right? I want to pump them spiritual weights. I want to eat those spiritual food. I want my face in the word of God. I want to be encouraged. I want to be strong so that I know that if it does happen to me, yes, I'm in good company. 
and I will do exactly what they did, be faithful to the end. Amen? Father, we want to thank you this morning for that. I want to thank you, Lord, for all those who have gone before us, all of those who we have an example of their faithfulness to you and the ultimate example of Jesus and his faithfulness to you and to us. Even though he was rich, yet he became poor for us, that through him we might become rich. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we're sitting in this room this morning rich in your love, rich in your righteousness, and we are children of God today. You know, if you're in here this morning and maybe you're struggling with that, maybe you don't know if you're a child of God. Maybe you would like to seal the deal. Maybe you would like to be sure. Or maybe you're just struggling with life and you need prayer and encouragement. I would just say, there's some folks over here that would love to pray with you. They stand here every Sunday. And if you need prayer, please see them after. Get prayer. Don't leave without it. And Father, we do want to give you the glory and the honor. Thank you so much for your word. Oh, Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. And without it, Lord, we truly would be lost. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Shame on me. I was asked to mention to you, a lot of you know Hoot and Lois. Um, we have a thing going where we want to make some meals for them. And so if you would like to participate in that process, you know, things like, you know, casseroles or something that they can eat on more than one night. Uh, they're not really able to cook and things like that for themselves. Um, they need our help. And so if you would like to be a part of that, there is a, a sign-up sheet in the foyer out there that you can put your name on. And we're going to do it kind of on a rotational basis. What's the commitment? Um, it's three months on Mondays and Thursdays. Three months on Mondays and Thursdays. So if you want to be part of that, share that three-month Monday and Thursday time. You can sign up out there. And let me just put a footnote on that. If you're here this morning, we want to help, you. We want to help our seniors. We want to be there for you guys. And Lonnie and Chris have taken up that mantle. If you have needs, if you need something done around your home, if you need meals, if you would speak to them, they would love to be able to help you guys out. Isn't it neat to have folks like that around, huh? Amen. So God bless you guys. Thank you. Rising
Jesus, you're the rock. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. Dear Lord, thank you so, so much for this wonderful time together that we just get to dig deep into your word, Lord, and just uh, praise you because you deserve all the glory, Lord. And uh, when we're struggling, Lord, um, we uh, know that actually um, when we call on you, you meet us where we're at. So that, um, you know, we don't have to climb to you, Lord, because you know that we're, we would never be able to, to meet that, Lord. And, and whenever we um, get to experience that, Lord, it just gives us so much hope um, in the future, in the, the days to come, Lord. Um, and thank you so much for just giving us that wonderful opportunity. We turn from feeling so insignificant to feeling significant, Lord, and it's just such a blessing, Lord. Thank you so much for giving us purpose. And Lord, we want to use that purpose. We want to use it for you, for your glory, so that other people will make it to know you more as well. In your precious name, amen. We hope you all have a blessed week. Thank you. I will stay. I lift my hands to heaven, hear my heart surrender. I tell my soul again. Spirit is enough to keep me walking